Um, okay, so welcome to the session on uh, integrable systems uh, that I'm chairing together with uh, Alvaro Pelayo, who is also online. And uh, so the first talk will be by Thomas Hausel from uh, the Institute uh, uh, of I IST of Vienna, Institute of Science and Technology, Austria. And uh, he will talk about explicit hitching systems on Lagrangians. Please, Thomas. You, you are muted. Sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. And what if I am on the presentation? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, I am going to talk about um, the on uh, new coordinates for certain Lagrangians where we can write down the Hitchin system explicitly. So this is an, uh, a joint project with Nigel Hitchin, which is a continuation of our previous uh, paper, which appeared on the archive this January. And so let's start with um, defining um, what, um, what is this Hitchin integrable system. Um, so it is attached to a smooth projective complex curve. Typically, you would think of one which has genus bigger than one. And uh, we will take the total space of the Hitchin integrable system with certain collection of Higgs bundles on the curve. So a Higgs bundle is a pair of a vector bundle E. We will fix the rank to be N. And uh, together with the Higgs field, which is a section of the endomorphism bundle of E tensor with the canonical bundle. So locally, you can think of this as a matrix of one forms on the curve. That's what a Higgs bundle is locally. Then we will take a collection of them, the, the so-called moduli space of semi-stable rank n degree zero Higgs bundles. And there are various techniques to construct this space. And this space is going to be the total space, a complex algebraic variety, which is non-projective. will be the total space of the each integrable system. And the Hitchin system itself is the following map. On the, you take a Higgs bundle, you take um, its Higgs field, and um, you compute its characteristic polynomial. And then you take the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, and they will live in these vector spaces, sections of various powers of the canonical bundle. So it turns out that the dimension of this vector space is half of the dimension of the total space. And, and this is really leads to this uh, beautiful observation of, of Hitchin, that this map gives us a integrable system, a completely integrable system. So this is what we call the Hitchin system. It is a proper map. It is a completely integrable Hamiltonian system with respect to some natural holomorphic symplectic form on the variety. Again, everything is complex or integrable system is a complex algebraic integrable system, but it is proper uh, and you have as many Hamiltonians as, as needed as possible, the largest amount of possible, namely half of the dimension of the symplectic manifold. This was first constructed by Hitchin in 1987. It grew out from his work on studying the two-dimensional reductions of uh, the four-dimensional young male secretions. And by now, there are many works which manage to relate or describe almost all known completely the integrable systems or their complexification as a, some version of a Hitchin system. So besides its inherent importance for integrable system, it also plays a pivotal role in the proof of the fundamental lemma in the Leglands program due to NGO in 2010 when he received a Fields Medal for this work. And also it is pivotal 
in mirror symmetry for Lagrange dual Hitchin systems, which in the mathematical literature first appeared in, the, in our work with Tadeusz in 2002, and then in, later in the physics seminal physics work of Kapustin and Witten in 2006. So today I'm going to consider the Hitchin system, or rather an X-ray of the Hitchin system, and I'm going to tell you about a, a natural way, a natural Lagrangian foliation on this uh, integrable system, and we will be studying the integrable systems on these Lagrangian leaves. To understand, uh, to, this, to define these Lagrangian leaves, we will look at the theory of Bialynitsky Birula. On, uh, which was originally introduced on a variety together with the circle action. In our case, the circle, the complex circle C star, acts on our variety just by scaling the Higgs field. And this particular C star action has the property that it is a semi projective, half projective, in the following sense. It has the meaning, it, it has the property first that the fixed point variety is projective. And second, uh, every limit uh, of uh, applying for a fixed Higgs bundle, you apply, you rescale the Higgs field, and then there is going to be a limiting Higgs bundle when lambda tends to zero. In such a Higgs bundle, the limiting one will actually be automatically invariant by C star. But we claim that if you start with a non C star equivalent um, Higgs bundle, you still get a limit point at this uh, lambda equals zero limit. And we can see actually these two properties can be easily de derived by the observation that what I already mentioned, that this was a proper uh, map. And additionally, that the uh, H, the int or integrable system is C star equivariant, where C star acts on the Higgs moduli spaces above. And on the base of the Hitchin system, on this vector space, it acts by weight i on the i-th component in this decomposition. The important point is that it acts in this vector space with positive weights. Because of that, there will be a single fixed point of the C star action, namely the origin. And then you can deduce uh, all these properties by just uh, this, these observations that this map is proper and C star equivalent. So if we take a fixed point of the C star action, then we can look at all those Higgs bundles, F, whose limit point in their, their, or the C star orbit of them, their limit when lambda goes to zero is going to be our uh, C star fixed point, E. We can do it for all of these uh, fixed points. And uh, we will get this way what we call the upward flow from the fixed point, E. So to each um, E, we can collect all these Higgs bundles which flow to E. This will be the upward flow from E. Now, Bjorn and Iskibirula gave um, a local study of these um, subsets at first. These are just subsets. And he, he proved that they are subvarieties, locally closed subvarieties in the, in the total space. Obviously, he didn't look at the Higgs moduli space, but for a general variety X and the C star action only. And he proved, moreover, which will be crucial for us, that these um, single um, upward flows are isomorphic to vector spaces. In fact, he actually gives an isomorphism, not a canonical one, which will be crucial for us, but there is an isomorphism with the vector space, which is um, the tangent space at the fixed point, taking only the positive weights in the C direction, the positive part of the tangent space. In fact, you can, he also proves that, or we can also prove that this is a C star equivariant isomorphism we can find. So what we understand that this cell itself is a vector space and we understand how C star acts on it from infinitesimal information at the fixed point E. Moreover, in our case, we have a special uh, situation when uh, our C star action interacts with our Holomorphic symplectic form in a very nice way, namely, um, it's a homogeneity one symplectic form, meaning that the pullback of the symplectic form is just the scalar multiple of it. And in such a situation, you can prove we can prove that um, that or uh, upward flow, all of the upward flows will actually be Lagrangian. 
So what we have, the, now we have these vector spaces, cells, which are Lagrangian, and because of the property of semi-projectivity, they will partition the whole space. So if you like, it's a sort of foliation. I wouldn't really, maybe it's a singular foliation. Uh, you do have uh, some singularities in the ocean space. But anyway, it's, I usually call it a partition. So we are partitioning or uh, symplectic variety into locally closed Lagrangian cells. And, and the main problem for today is what I call the X-ray problem for the Hitchin system, is to find coordinates on these uh, Lagrangian cells so that one can describe the restricted Hitchin system, restricting the Hitchin system to this cell. We have now have a map between vector spaces of the same dimensions, an algebraic map, so it's some polynomial map, and or task or, or aim or, or project today is to find coordinates where we can actually describe this map explicitly. In order to do this, I will introduce a notion which will help us uh, accomplish this task. So this notion is the so-called multiplicity algebra of this restricted Hitchin system. So this uh, Hitchin system, again, is a map between vector spaces of the same dimension, let's call that uh, just for simplicity, capital N. And so we have this algebraic map between um, two vector spaces. If you find some nice homogeneous coordinates on Cn, uh, on both Cn's, then you can write the map in these homogeneous coordinates by these N coordinate functions, if you want it to be something explicit. And that's our aim. We want to really understand uh, these N tuple of functions in some nice coordinates, but you can just take any coordinate in order to understand the definition of um, this multiplicity algebra. So the multiplicity algebra conceptually is something very simple. One takes um, this up, our upward flow, which is, you recall, a subvariety in the total space of the Hitchin integrable system, and one takes the scheme theoretical pre-image of zero by the Hitchin system. It's called the nilpotent cone. Uh, the support of this are the Higgs bundles where the Higgs field is uh, nilpotent. That's why it's named, but it's a scheme. It's a sub-scheme. The, the pre-image of a point is a sub-scheme. And you intersect scheme theoretically with this um, sub-variety, sub which you also think of as a sub-scheme. And then you will get some, and typically we will see, you will get some complicated scheme. And the ring of functions of that scheme is what we will call the multiplicity algebra. Anyway, it is the right notion of the intersection of the, uh, the total space of this map, which is this vector space, and, and the pre-image of zero there. Okay, I will give you much more down to earth way to, to think about this. We will just take all functions on the total space of this restricted teaching map on this upward flow. Again, this is a vector space, this is just polynomial ring. And we will take the idea in here generated by elements which come from the pre image by age of the maximal ideal at origin. So you take all your algebraic functions on the base vanishing at zero. You pull it back by age, or you compose it with age, you will get some function here, and you take the idea generated by them. And this uh, complicated uh, thing just becomes this very simple thing. So it's a polynomial ring by, by this idea. And in fact, in these explicit homogeneous coordinates, you can, you can see that uh, this ideal is the same just by taking these n components, homogeneous components of your function, and you just take. This, this particular ideal in this polynomial. So it's extremely explicit, this algebra, once you have chosen uh, coordinates for, for, your, for your function. And uh, amusingly, the way how we got to this was really amusing. This notion is known, in fact, had been studied in singularity theory, and in particular in this book uh, of Arnold and others in 1982, where they actually give a whole list of properties of this algebra. They call it, um, they call it um, local algebra, so you might not have heard the name multiplicity algebra, but unfortunately, local algebra is already used in many other aspects in mathematics, so I think it's a more 
fortunate name is the multiplicity algebra. And you will see in a moment that it really is, uh, has to do with multiplicity. So we will mostly concentrate on the case when this algebra is uh, finite dimensional, which is equivalent to, to say that uh, this scheme is zero dimensional. So, and I will just now list you a, a, a string of equivalences. So this will be the case exactly when the Hitchin restricted Hitchin map is a proper map, roughly with meeting just means that the primage of any point is finitely many. In this case, it's a finite map, in fact, because we are between affine varieties. It is uh, equivalent, on the other hand, the map is proper is equivalent with the assumption that um, the upward flow inside the total space is closed because if it is closed there, then of course, if I restrict the proper Hitchin map to a closed subset, I, I still get a, uh, a proper map. So this way it's clear to see. And then one more result is that this is equivalent, this being closed is actually equivalent with something I said in the beginning, that the support of the intersection is actually just one point. It's a zero dimensional scheme. So set theoretically, if I intersect the upward flow with the nil potent cone, then the only guy there is the or original fixed point by the cis direction, which is automatically nil potent. So you can formulate this, and this is our definition for a C star fixed point Higgs bundle to be very stable, is that its upward flow doesn't contain any nil potent Higgs bundle except for, for E itself. So that's our definition of very stable. And these strings give you some conceptual base to think about what does it mean to be very stable. For us, really, it means that this algebra is finite dimensional. And our aim will be that in the very stable case to describe this finite dimensional algebra. But let me tell you even more beautiful properties of this algebra. It's not just a C algebra. In fact, it has uh, some amazing properties. First, the dimension of this in our case, when it is now very stable, is what Arnold actually, I guess, and their school, they define this to call this the multiplicity of the, of the zero under the restricted teaching map. So you take the pre-image, it will be a thick point, but you, you want to say what the multiplicity of this is. It is actually the same as the pre-image of a generic point, the cardinality of that. So it's the right notion of multiplicity of such a map, is the dimension of the algebra. Then uh, for us, uh, and also amazingly later, I found it in their book, they also look at this by some other name. Uh, this case when the map is not just any polynomial map, but it is C star equivariant. So you recall that here we know the C star weights coming from the tangent space at that point and all the positive weights. And here again, we know what the C star weights are. And because HE is equivariant, we will get an action on the multiplicity algebra by C star, which will uh, decompose our algebra as a graded algebra. So we actually have naturally a graded algebra. And in this finite dimensional case, we will only have finitely many graded pieces. And the top graded piece will be one dimensional, the um, generated by the Jacobian of the integral of the, of the Hitching map. Um, you will have the multiplication map from the opposite uh, degree, opposite graded parts, which actually can be write, written down beautifully by residue formula. And then they prove that this is a non-degenerate pairing. So this ring, what we have is a graded Poincaré duality ring. It's really, really a beautiful uh, object. And amaz amazingly to me, they also looked at this expression. So if you now take the Poincaré polynomial of this algebra, the generating function of the dimension of the graded pieces, then you can compute it by infinitesimal information just from the C star module of the, of the two vector spaces we had at hand. I, I will not describe this, what it exactly is, but it is some simple formula which computes you this uh, Poincaré polynomial, which then, because it's a Poincaré duality ring, we know that all the coefficients are integer, positive integer, non-negative integers. It's a monic polynomial, which is moreover polydromic because of Poincaré duality. 
And this was actually the starting point of this project because the, this uh, polynomial had appeared in our previous paper with Nigel, which we call the equivariant multiplicity of a very stable upward flow. And it played an important role in numerical quantity, which we attached uh, to the upward flow in our study of mirror symmetry uh, for this upward flow. But then after this observation, we realized that you can significantly enhance this polynomial because there is an actual Poincaré duality ring, namely the multiplicity algebra of uh, the Hitchin system, which, uh, which, uh, which explains what it is. And so our problem is, can we determine this uh, algebra explicitly? If we do, then of course we will, can find this H1 and HN and we solve our original problem. So let me just tell you then one set of cases when we can do this. So in the case, what is called very stable type one, one we have a complete answer. So I will be um, slightly sketchy just to, to first explain to you what does it mean type one, one. It means that the vector bundle that composes as a direct sum of line bundles M0 to M and minus one N line bundles MK. And the Higgs field will just go from one uh, small bundle to the next, mk to mk plus one. This will be this little Higgs field, which will be a section of a line bundle itself. So we will represent the first line bundle with uh, any divisor, and these line, these little Higgs fields will represent it with the uh, effective divisor. Only positive, non-negative coefficients will appear here. And to this delta, then we can attach this uh, Higgs bundle of uh, type 1, 1, 1 fixed by the C's direction. It's only non zero in the below the main diagonal. Um, and um, right. And then we have this theorem from the previous paper that such a Higgs bundle is very stable if and only if these um, effective divisors, the last n minus 1 divisors added together, is reduced meaning that um, all the zeros of the BIs are single and distinct. Furthermore, we had computed the equivariant multiplicity back then, and we found this beautiful formula that it is the product of T binomial coefficients, quantum binomial coefficients of n choose k, where k goes from one to n minus one. And so maybe it's not surprising then to learn that what we can now prove is that uh, the main result for today's, my today's talk, is that um, for such a very stable type one, one Higgs bundle, the multiplicity al algebra is exactly the product of the cohomology rings of, with complex coefficients of the corresponding Grassmannians of K planes in C, Cm. So just one quick word of the proof, we do prove this by taking Hecke transformations of the Hitchin section the Hitchin section is nothing but uh, the upward flow from this uh, type of Higgs bundle when all the divisors are trivial. Everything here is one, and the bundle is very simple, starting with the trivial bundle. It's called the canonical uniformizing Higgs bundle. And you take the upward flow from this, and this turns out to be the Hitchin section. And now you will do Hecke transformations on it. And it turns out that the space of Hecke transformations for vector bundles are these Grassmannians. That's how Grassmannians appear. And they're playing in those Grassmannians. You can discover that the multiplicity algebra is indeed the cohomology of these Grassmannians. And so this solves the problem in the sense that, um, um, that um, we get explicit coordinates for the Hitchin system via, for example, the famous uh, or well-known presentations of the cohomology ring. And in fact, this is a, a form which does show up for us in one of our proofs. Namely, you take n variables p1 to pk and q1 to qn minus k, and you form from the two polynomials, two monic polynomials, one at degree k, with the first k1 and the last n minus k1, you form another polynomial, monic polynomial q of degree n minus k. And the relation is that the product of these two polynomials is just x to the n. If you know about the cohomology of Grassmannian, you just notice that this is the assumption that the churn class of total churn class of the, of the tautological bundle times the quotient tautological bundle is just one. That is uh, the sum is the trivial uh, bundle. 
So that, in that sense, we have solved this problem in this case. And now let me just make a few comments uh, before finishing. Um, and um, so first, I just want to say that we managed to generalize this to several directions, this argument. First to wobbly, that means non-very stable type 1-1 one, one cases. In here, the Grassmannians will be replaced by, uh, um, by Schubert, uh, spherical Schubert cells in FI Grassmannians. Another direction to generalize is for other groups, G, where you, you the Lagrangians, uh, where the Grassmannians will be replaced by minuscule flag varieties. Then we understand in this case what mirror symmetry should do, or we conjecture in this case what mirror symmetry should do. And maybe one important point I want to make here at the end is that in one case, namely the, we started as the rank two case very carefully. And in the genus three case, we managed to find the family of uh, multiplicity algebras, which where the all the algebras are different in the family. So that shows that what we have are studying is not a discrete object, this algebra, but it, 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 um, it can depend on parameters. And in particular, it cannot be the homologing of a compact manifold, these examples. And finally, just to finish with the problem, uh, I want to say that because of our original motivations from mirror symmetry, when we uh, think about the push forward by the very stable a restricted hitching map of the very stable Lagrangian upward flow, the structure sheaf of that. We expect a vector bundle on the hitching base, which we, by mirror symmetry, we expect to have a hyperholomorphic connection for E very stable. And so I finish with a problem because there is now a natural family. If I take the corresponding upward flow, which gave us the Grassmannian, uh, where over zero, I have the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian and generically, I will have a semi-simple algebra. If this connection, which we have by mirror symmetry, or should have by mirror symmetry, maybe is going to give us the quantum cohomology ring of the Grassmannian. So that was basically what I wanted to say. And then I give you a last slide just to marvel at uh, just a very few first examples in rank two. And genus two, here you can see all possibilities. It's a complete classification of multiplicity algebras in genus two. In this case, capital N is three. And genus three, we have this family, continuous family of multiplicity algebras. So I have put it here. So that's, uh, that's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, we have one question. Uh, I see on the last slide uh, the word dominant. So uh, what, what does it mean? This means this is an algebraic map from a one vector space to another. It means it's a subjective, <coughs> basically. Okay, thanks. As an algebraic map, it's dominant. So maybe I have a question. So. Uh, so you, you mentioned that in some cases, but uh, do you have an, a general expect, expectation on how these uh, multiplicity algebras uh, change when you vary parameters or, or you move on the... It's an extremely good question. Obviously, this is the next thing we should do. If you have the X-ray, now we would like to connect these X-rays together. We have on every of our films, I have my multiplicity algebra. And in some cases, like genus two, uh, we know all these multiplicity algebras. Now the question is, how do they change in families? And so that's a very good question. And we don't uh, understand anything here yet. But that's the next thing to, to think about. I hope there will be like connections or things which will connect these algebras. But once you understand this, then basically you will be able to write down the Hitchin system explicitly um, once, once you know how they, they change these multiplicity algebras. Okay, thank you. Mm. So if there are no I, more, uh, yes. I mean, I, I got also a very short question. I mean, maybe it's a little bit stupid, but uh, me coming from more from differential geometry and dynamical systems, is there a way to visualize these things? I mean, is there a way to, to draw a nice picture to such that people more from geometry, I mean, get well, a better feeling for it? 
Yes, I mean, actually, Nigel had some talks that he gave nice pictures. But what's exciting for me, because when I started, actually, my studies in differential topology, I was taught about this singularity theory. So, in fact, these maps are somehow describing you singularities. And then you can obviously draw beautiful pictures of singularities and things like that. And, and then now we find that these kind of things, what we are studying, were studied before by singularity theorists. So at the end, I'm sure there will be beautiful pictures, the, the pictures describing these multiplicity algebras, or rather these uh, uh, holomorphic maps between CN to CN. Yes, indeed, they have very nice pictures in the mm. background. OK, thanks. OK, so in view of time, maybe we'll thank the speaker again. Thanks a lot for this nice talk. Thank you. So, uh, Vasily, are you there? Hello. Hello, Vasily. Yes, do you hear me well? Yes, I hear you. Okay, wonderful. So let me share the screen. Yes, please. Okay, uh, one second. One second, so that would be this window. Yes, very good. Uh, okay, you see the preview, right? Yes. Okay, so the next... Okay. The next talk will be by Vasily Pestun from uh, Institut des Hautes Études Scientifiques in Bur, and he will talk about multiplicative Higgs bundles. Please, Vasily. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to the Congress. Uh, my talk would be about multiplicative Higgs bundles. And uh, this uh, version, uh, I mean, it's a theory of integrable system similar uh, to the previous talk that you just heard about uh, Hitchin systems. And I describe a certain like alternative uh, for it for you know, uh, construction. So um, this talk uh, is based on the papers with uh, Chris Elliott and uh, Ruben Frasik and Alexander Zumbalik um, in, um, published in the following papers mentioned here. So uh, to start our review of what uh, teaching system is just uh, on a slide, well, you've just had a talk. So uh, for, for a complex variety X and effective divisor D and the complex reductive group G, uh, we define G Higgs bundles as a pair, P comma phi, where P is a principal G bundle and uh, phi is a, is a section of their the algebra agent valued bundle associated to the principal bundle P tensor uh, K sub X of D, where K is canonical uh, line bundle on X. Then we have the theorem that there is an algebraically integrable system on the module space of meromorphic uh, Higgs bundles on the curve, in the case when X is a curve, uh, going back to Hitchin, Markman, Batachin, Mukai, Turing, and uh, others. Now, uh, my background is in quantum field theory, string theory, and uh, I work on integrable system in relations to uh, those subjects. So um, the way I, I so so in a way uh, this topic connects uh, to other works, uh, which is interesting to me, is the uh, geometric Langlands program, uh, the way it was described by Bellinson, Greenfield, and Kapustin, Witten. Uh, also, the construction of the compactification of the six-dimensional two comma zero self-dual theory on X, uh, viewed as a four-dimensional n equals two supersymmetric theory by Gaiota and Zaberkwitten. Then uh, the quantization of the Hitchin system relates to so-called nekrasov shatashvili limit of the former mentioned four-dimensional equals two theory in the omega background, that's the equivalent deformation using the rotations or isometries of the four-dimensional space. And also after further uh, hyper color rotation, the Hitchin system relates to the total theory and correlation functions determined by the W algebra. Well, W algebra is a version like uh, Virasora, but uh, for high rank uh, uh, the algebras. 
that's uh, the famous work of Holdai, Gayot, and Fujikawa. So, uh, okay, well, Hitchin system is an example of a more general construction called an abstract Higgs bundle as defined by Danegi and Danegi and Gatsby. So the ordinary Hitchin system on a curve X uh, with singular edges and divisor D is an example of a system of an abstract Higgs bundle on X valued in canonical line bundle K sub X of D. And then uh, one can deform this construction making it more abstract and define an abstract G X bundle as a pair P comma C where P is a principal bundle and uh, C is a sum bundle of the Lie algebra value the joint bundle defined uh, as uh, a space of the centralizers the Lie algebra G of regular elements uh, in the group. And then the Nagy Gaisgari des described uh, an abstract construction that's an abstract X bundle and an abstract spectral data X tilde comma T where uh, X tilde is an abstract chemical cover and uh, tau is a T bundle, the bundle of uh, toric uh, fiber over X tilde, like, like Louisville fi uh, fibers. So um, now this, to relate to the usual definition of the Higgs bundle, we consider an abstract bundle P comma C valued in their line bundle K sub X in the canonical line bundle. And uh, we add a section phi to the spectral data. And we add W invariant collection of maps of maps from the spectral cover X tilde to T uh, to cotangent T star sub X. And then the space of values could be replaced. Uh, the space of values that is the usual canonical line bundle, which we have in the Hessian system, can be replaced by any family of abelian groups Y fiber over X. And the Higgs field phi would become a section of C tensor Y, where Y is a family of abelian groups. And then to that abstract spectral data, X tilde comma T and the collection of apps, we, uh, we associate a modular space that's uh, called by the Nagin Gatsgari, uh, Higgs sub G of Y over X. So well, Y is a family of abelian groups. Now, suppose that, first suppose that Y just suppose that y just you have a algebraic variety and y is fiber over x and generic fiber is an elliptic curve. So in this case, the Nagy has shown that the modular space bond G over y of G bundles on y is isomorphic with the modular space of G Higgs bundles on x of those abstract G Higgs bundles on x with values in this elliptic vibration y over x. So in a sense, it's like a compactification, uh, well, or alternative version to the uh, uh, Hitchin system where the vertical fibers, instead of being canonical line bundle X, they became elliptically uh, compact uh, fibers. So, so if Y is itself a uh, two-dimensional algebraically integrable system fiber over X, then the resulting modular space of G bundles and Y is an algebraic integrable system. So that's a theorem about uh, an ability to pull back uh, symplectic form uh, from Y to the module space of G bundles on Y when, when Y is symplectic. So, so now famously, uh, we can consider the hierarchy of uh, three like classes or three versions of what happens in the fibers. If you take Y to be two dimensional and X to be one dimensional. So Y sub X, the fibers Y sub X are just one dimensional complex connected abelian groups. And of course there are uh, three cases, uh, namely the uh, elliptic curve, the most general case, then uh, the generation of the elliptic curve to the nodal uh, limit when uh, it turns into multiplicative group or C star, C mod Z, or just G multiplicative group. I will use uh, three connotations. Or if you consider further degener degeneration, then it would turn into additive group that's a complex line or a cause de degeneration of elliptical curve. Right, and uh, so for those three cases of uh, of classes of the vertical fiber, when it's elliptic curve, when it's multiplicative group, or when it's additive group, we would have respective integrable systems. And Hitchin systems comes for the abelian case, uh, sorry, for the additive case when their vertical fiber is a complex line C, uh, twisted by canonical line bundle, right? Uh, when the vertical fiber is uh, elliptic curve, then uh, we have the integrable system being just the modular space of G bundles 
on Y, and that was studied very well by uh, Danagi. And uh, then we have the intermediate case when it's multiplicative group. And uh, there was a question uh, that Danagi posed in uh, his uh, lecture, Geometry and Integrability, uh, back to 2003. Like, what exactly happens if you consider the multiplicative case? So I'll just present a few perspectives on this uh, situation of the multiplicative Higgs bundles uh, to, to answer uh, that question. So we'll explore uh, the geometry of the multiplicative Higgs bundles, G over X. Okay, uh, so for this talk, I'll focus on the uh, horizontally rational case. So I'll use the conventions where the base is like horizontal and the fibers are vertically. And so that would, uh, the terminology refers to uh, horizontal for the base and vertical for the fibers. And here I will consider when uh, the uh, base is, uh, uh, is just uh, P1 minus infinity, that's a complex line. Uh, but what we are doing here, what we're discussing would be equally well applicable when X is multiplicative for uh, elliptic curve. R2. So for here, we'll, fi we'll fix X to be P1 with uh, a section DX of the canonical line bundle uh, with a degree two polar infinity. So it's just the normal coordinates that's DX. We'll fix the divisor D. So the divisor D would be colored or decorated by um, dominant, by, by, by cone, sorry, by, by, uh, by values in the cone of dominant co weights of the co weight lattice lambda check. So that is, uh, uh, we take their uh, linear combinations uh, of those uh, co weights um, and decorated, sorry, of, of points on X decorated by those uh, uh, co weights or coefficients in the co weights. So now let's give a definition of the multiplicative Higgs bundle via, for those data. So if we uh, say the curve X uh, and we consider framing at uh, X uh, infinity, that's infinity on the line, with the singularities in the co-weight value device D, that would be pair uh, P comma G, where P is the principal G bundle on X with the framing at infinity. And uh, small G would be a section of the group value the joint bundle on X uh, group value adjoint bundle on X, I denote by capital uh, AD sub G. And this section of group value adjoint bundle is, uh, has, has prescribed singularities, namely near each uh, point uh, in this divisor D that's, uh, that's taken with the coefficient uh, of uh, omega sub I check, where omega sub I check is a co weight. And we can think about the co weight as a map from C star to the maximal torus of G, right? So we can write in local coordinates as uh, X is mapped to, to the X to the power omega sub I. And we require that there exist local holomorphic sections, G sub L, G sub R, that's for multiplication from the left and multiplication from the right, such that uh, G of X has this singularity. So there is something local holomorphic function times the singularity with prescribed co-weight taken value in the group and times local holomorphic function. Also we'll fix the framing of P and the value of G of X at infinity. So the space of uh, such, uh, such objects is uh, the module space of multiple G, uh, G bundles with framing at infinity and prescribed sing uh, singularity. And that's, um, uh, that, that, that would be integrable system as, as we will see uh, soon. So uh, more abstractly in the formal neighborhood of which puncture X sub I in the divisor, the restriction of multiplicative Higgs field G defines an element of algebraic loop group G uh, formal uh, Lorentz series. Uh, here Z is the local coordinate. And uh, this element is defined after the adjoint action of the positive part of the loop group, that's G uh, in formal Taylor series. And the singularity class doesn't change under the left to right multiplication by uh, the positive part. So, so that means that the singularity class of an element of uh, formal loop, loop group is a coset in the affine Grassmannian, that is formal loop group quotient from the left and from the right by the positive part of the loop group, or it's the same as uh, Grassmannian, as the orbits of the positive loop group in the Grassmannians. So, and those orbits in the affine Grassmannian are 
well known to be in canonical bijection with dominant co-weights of G. So in a sense, what, what we've done, what we've done when we fix the degree at each puncture, we've chosen uh, a dominant co-weight uh, in the dominant co-weight lattice of G, or we've chosen an orbit in a fine gross line, right, at each puncture. So, uh, so now the modular space that I denote in this slide in the slide says M for multiplicative. So modular space of multiplicative Higgs bundles uh, with uh, group G and framing at infinity of X uh, comma D would be the modular space that we've just uh, that we've just defined. So those spaces have been considered before, sometimes under the names of modular space of G pairs or uh, other names. And uh, some of your other works include uh, papers by Batachin, uh, Artunov, Frolov, Medvedev, Cherkis, Kapustin, Braden, Chernikov, Dolgosh, Plevin, Alchanesky, Zotov, Portuguese Markman, uh, Frankel, and Go in the work related to geometric Lang lands and uh, Boutier and probably others. Okay. So now, while the structure of multiplicative Higgs bundles makes sense for any curve X, the module space carries canonical symplectic structure only in the very special situation when uh, curve X is itself Calabiao. So we have a prescribed and degenerate section of the canonical line bundle KX. And this is possible if X is a flat curve. So we'll consider X to be a C or C star elliptic curve, but for this talk, uh, I'll consider X plus C. Um, now, now let's let's consider the following thing. So let's consider k of x to be the field of the rational functions on x. So that would be, uh, uh, and then g of k of x being the infinite dimensional Lie group valued in k of x. So that's just like rationally valued uh, g valued functions on x. And g sub one by g sub one, I will denote the subgroup of elements which are framed at infinity, so that uh, we fix uh, the limit of g as g goes to infinity to be one. And then this this group, this infinite dimensional group g sub one of k of x, it carries the structure of Poisson Lie group, where um, the Poisson structure called Sklanin Poisson structure is defined by so-called rational R matrix with with this kernel. Where omega in G tensor G is a quadratic casimir in use from a killing form on G. So that's a uh, uh, very well known, famous R, uh, little R matrix, right? They're coming from the works of Daniel Rishitikin, Raymond, Smenov, and Shansky in the 80s. And uh, explicitly, the uh, Sklanin Poisson structure defines uh, Poisson brackets or R matrix um, defined uh, brackets on. Evaluation functions. So, given algebraic function from G from the group to C and the point X on the curve, we can consider evaluation functions phi sub X that are the compositions of phi and evaluation maps of X. And then uh, the Poisson bracket on the evaluation functions f x sub y and f x sub two is uh, defined uh, in terms of the left and right gradients or uh, on a vector field uh, uh, xi on, on, on G. So that, uh, so that the Poisson bracket of phi x1 and phi x2 at the evaluated at element G of that infinite dimensional rational Lie, uh, Lie group is, uh, is given by this uh, equation. So the, there is a kernel one over x1 minus x2, and uh, then uh, a difference between uh, the Contraction of uh, the left and right of the left gradients minus uh, uh, right gradients. Uh, now, well, if uh, okay, let me skip this not, uh, critical. So, so now the key the key result that we have is that the module space of multiplicative Higgs bundles, as uh, we've defined it before uh, in geometrical way, is actually a symplectic leaf. In this infinite dimensional Poisson Lie group with this Kleinian bracket, right? So, so, so this is a sub variety uh, in this infinite dimensional Poisson Lie group. And we can prove that that uh, sub variety is actually symplectic with respect to the Poisson structure defined on the infinite dimensional Poisson Lie group G sub 1, the Poisson structure coming from this Kleinian bracket. 
And, and, and consequently, uh, this uh, modular space of multiplicative Higgs bundles, it carries canonical holomorphic symplectic structure uh, defined by this rational R matrix. So to illustrate, uh, I will just illustrate briefly. Uh, by the way, uh, I started later my presentation. Could you tell me what's my uh, end time limit? Yeah, you have something like 10 minutes. Or 10 minutes, yes, minutes. yes, yes. Right, okay, okay. I have more slides like for larger talks, but I'm going to skip proofs of certain theorems, so that's fine. Okay, so, uh, so th this is a symplectic leaf and to uh, the proof goes um, uh, as follows. Uh, first of all, we identify the deformation in the tangent uh, of G with the left and right multiplication on infinitesimal multiplication. And through the stock, these uh, sections of the left and right multiplications, the infinitesimal ones, uh, would be denoted by psi L and psi R. And there is equivalence relation because uh, we can move uh, through the uh, group element G uh, from the left to the right. So there is equivalent the equivalence between a pair, psi left, psi R, defined by this uh, formula, right? And, and then uh, away from the divisor, the pair psi left, psi right, psi right is a section of the quotient uh, bundle. And that's how we can identify the tangent uh, space to the multiplicative, uh, to the module space of multiplicative uh, Higgs fields. So uh, one um, a nice computation we can do is uh, actually compute the dimension of the module space uh, of this multiplicative Higgs bundles. So given the deformations that we identify with the left and right multiplications, uh, there is a way to, uh, to identify the, 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 the global space of deformations by considering its uh, local structure at every puncture, and uh, then to write explicitly what are the possible um, generators for the tangent space. Uh, deforming the module space of multi multiplicative uh, Higgs bundles at each point. And uh, this formula explicitly gives uh, those local generators. And uh, it has a sum over all divisor points, and it has a sum over, uh, over Lie algebra uh, uh, weights. Uh, and it's conditioned on the dominant co weight by which each divisor is decorated. And uh, then when the computation goes through, one finds that the total dimension of the deformation space, so the module space of Higgs bundles, would be the uh, contraction between the, the while vector rho, uh, that's uh, half sum of all uh, positive um, roots, and uh, the total weights, that's the sum of all dominant co weights that we have inserted at every point. So that's a cute formula. Um, we, now we have dimension, uh, then there is a, there is explicit uh, computation for uh, for to, to show that uh, the symplectic structure uh, on the model space of Higgs bundles, which is induced from the Poisson structure on that infinite dimensional Lie group, uh, uh, coincides. So let me uh, just uh, skip that. Uh, one proves uh, anti-symmetry and variance and. Um, and, uh, and then uh, we can prove explicitly that the symplectic uh, structure evaluated on the deformations uh, Xi1 and Xi2 of the modular space of Higgs bundles uh, precisely matches their Poisson bracket between the evaluation functions. Now, let me connect to another uh, topic, uh, this geometry, to the topic of periodic monopoles. So for this, one has to switch the context from the complex algebraic geometry to real differential geometry and consider the model space of solutions to nonlinear partial differential equations known as monopole Bogomolny equations defined on real three-dimensional Riemannian manifold, right? So it's a bit, little bit different uh, context, but it will be connected. And the connection is the following. We take X uh, to be R2, the real uh, two plane, identified with the complex line with a flat Euclidean metric. And then you consider M to be a flat three-dimensional manifold that's product of X times a circle. And we will lift the divisor, originally defined on X, to the divisor D tilde defined on M by taking uh, 
uh, certain vertical coordinates for uh, the circle at uh, each point on the divisor. And we consider G sub C to be maximal compact real form associated to a complex uh, group G. And then we take a principal compact GC bundle on M away from the divisors equipped with a smooth connection A, that's Hermitian connection A, and the smooth uh, Lie algebra G value scalar, scalar field point. That's typically called uh, monopole data. And then the monopole M with Dirac singularities defined by those co-ways on the three-dimensional space is a pair A comma phi of the connection with the joint value scalar field phi such that they satisfy this equation. This equation is, of course, the reduction from the four dimensions of uh, the self-dual equations. And uh, near each singularity, we require that the fields, the monopole fields, uh, be uh, have, have the asymptotics as their embedding of the unit U1 Dirac monopole by the core weight map omega check to the target Lie group. So the data match, and actually the geometry which is defined by the data uh, matches uh, uh, as follows. So given a monopole on X times S1, we can restrict the fields A sub phi to a horizontal slice, which doesn't contain any direct singularities. And then zero one part of the horizontal connection defines the structure of the holomorphic G bundle on X. And monopole equations further imply that, uh, that the connection, that the monopole scalar field of phi with uh, uh, complexified by the connection in vertical directions is uh, holomorphic with respect to the del bar, del bar uh, connection. So then there is a trivialization in which uh, del bar sub A is del bar. And the holonomy of uh, the monopole field around the vertical circle would be holomorphic on x minus d. And so there is a holonomy morphism from the module space of monopoles to the module space of Higgs bundles. And actually, uh, one can find the kernel of it and identify, uh, and identify more precisely uh, by using a version of Donaldson, Uhlenbeck, Yao, or Kabayashi Hitchin correspondence uh, for, for the stability condition on the module space of multiplicative Higgs bundles. And, uh, and, and, and then one can find the reverse map from the module space of the polystable multiplicative Higgs bundles to the module space of monopoles connection and uh, show for, I uh, provide for each uh, configuration of the uh, algebraic uh, multiplicative Higgs field, a certain monopole configuration by going like Adonis and Lundbeck Yao or Kobayashi Kitchen. So, so this harmonic matrix can be built by running a gradient descent uh, of the young null uh, functional. Uh, there is a hard analysis there to show that uh, the p floor actually reaches harmonic metric in the limit of uh, infinite time. For complex surfaces, that was done by Donaldson and by Simpson. And uh, in more later uh, work um, in uh, 17, Mochizuki, he uh, relaxed the previous uh, uh, certain assumptions of uh, Simpson, and uh, he finally constructed the UY or KH Kobayashi Hitchin correspondence from the multiplicative polystable bundles in Q1 to singular monopoles on R2 times S1. So now we have isomorphism between those two geometric constructions. And that isomorphism also has a parameter, a hypercalor parameter. Namely, the module space of singular monopoles, it uh, has a natural hypercalor structure induced by their self-dual from the solutions of the self-dual equations. So there is a P1 space of hypercalor structures. And that P1 space could be thought as a space of lines in uh, three-dimensional space. And when we take that line to be vertical, then the holomorphic 2 comma 0 form coming from the hypercalor structure matches precisely the holomorphic symplectic structure on the module space of uh, X bundles. So, so the next things uh, one can do with this construction is consider the hypercalor deformation of, um, uh, of uh, this uh, structure and identify under such hypercalor deformation the module space of monopoles with something else, namely with the module space of, uh, of epsilon 
uh, shifted connections. Uh, that's like a deformation of the modular space of Higgs bundles to the modular space of the connections when we take the Higgs field to be like to be aligned not vertically but twisted by some shift epsilon by some step epsilon every time one goes uh, uh, over the circle. Uh, so there is a theorem to identify the modular space of such uh, deformed uh, model, model space of monopoles and connections. Uh, everything goes through and uh, in the end one finds that under such epsilon twist uh, the, the deformation this deformation, there is a correspondence between uh, the so-called Steinberg section uh, of the model space of uh, Higgs bundles, that's an analog of Hitchens section, and uh, the brain of operas, which uh, uh, comes uh, in the work of the Kapustin Witten and uh, Mikrasa Pitten. And furthermore, when one quantizes that epsilon deformed uh, space or epsilon space of different operas, uh, one gets beta and zads, uh, like equations for the spectrum of the quantized integrable systems. And uh, one finds the connection with um, the difference W algebra. Uh, that's uh, a version of the Q deformed or yang yang version of the W algebra or Vera Sora uh, that, uh, that, 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 that comes uh, in uh, the study of uh, quantum integrable systems for yang yangs. So, uh, well, there are some more connections here. I'll finish and just leave this slide for you to uh, answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions first from the audience or online. So, Maybe I'll have a question. So in, in your second approach, this differential geometric one, so does it make sense yes. to consider X to be a curve of higher genus or, is, or do you have restrictions to? Yes, so in the second approach, when, uh, did you mean monopole approach? Monopole, or yes, monopole. In the monopole, right. So if you take monopole approach and we take X times this one, and we would like to study the monopole uh, equations, Yes, we can have a correspondence between the uh, monopoles uh, on this um, uh, uh, on this uh, x times uh, s1 and, uh, uh, and, and and the Higgs bundles. But what we lose here, we lose here uh, the symplectic uh, structure. So so the monopole space uh, carries a holomorphic natural hypercolor. Uh, metric uh, from which we use uh, holomorphic symplectic form. If the original space on which monopoles are defined, if the original space can be completed by uh, by adding a line bundle to uh, a hypercolor space. For example, if you have a flat, locally flat, three-dimensional space, you just completed by uh, a trivial uh, line bundle to a uh, four-dimensional space that carries a hypercolor structure. And then that hypercolor structure induces symplectic form, and that uh, passes uh, through, and uh, and then we get the symplectic form on the modular space of Higgs bundles. But if but if you don't uh, have uh, that uh, that form, so if you take a higher genus higher genus curve, so on higher genus curve we don't have a good section uh, uh, to define. Uh, the symplectic form on the modular space of multiple Higgs bundles, and also we don't have uh, a way to define a hypercolor structure in the modular space of monopoles. So there is like a geometric correspondence between the spaces, but they're not symplectic, and uh, and uh, we, we we don't uh, like we don't have a way to build integrable systems from. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks for this nice talk. Thank you. So the last uh, uh, talk of this session is by Sonia Holoch. Are you there, Sonia? Uh, yeah, let me Very just uh, see where I can yeah, please. try to share. Let's mm -hmm. see if I... Yes, we, can, we start to mm. see something. Yes. Okay, let them... 
Wait a moment. No, better? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Okay, so the next talk will be by Sonia Holoch from the University of Antwerp. And she will talk about extending uh, compact Hamiltonian S1 spaces to completely integrable systems with mild degenerations in dimension four. Please. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me to give a talk. And I mean, just to um, be sure about the time, so now it's a quarter past, so meaning I have until a quarter to six or something like that? Uh, yes, yes, and maybe you leave some time for questions. Okay, good, good, I try to. And next thing, a tiny little warning. I mean, I had yesterday a very bad computer crash and then spent some time on recovery and saving and so on, and I had to compose then my talk using um, <laughs> a recovery stick and very basic means. So, I mean, some of the diagrams are a little bit suboptimal, but I hope um, it's still okay. So, I mean, let's, let's go for it. <laughs> I mean, I didn't want to, um, uh, I should say, um, make the, the organizer nervous, so I just hope that it will work out and I think it will be fine. So let's hope the best. I mean, um, I need a little bit of notation and I wasn't really sure who would be in the audience. So I s start, let's say, quite basic and later on we see, I mean, how far we get actually. And so my um, notation for symplectic manifold is usually M for the manifold and omega for the uh, symplectic form. And I mean, the standard example and also the coordinates, if I ever use coordinates is then uh, Q1 to Qn, P1 to Pn, so Q and P using the model of R to N. I mean, so the standard model. And I mean, by the Booth theorem, we know that locally everything looks like that. So in case we want to have locally something going on, I mean, we need something else. So for example, some Hamiltonian system and so on to get something. Uh, because otherwise it's quite boring. I mean, if one doesn't look for global um, invariance and so on in symplectic geometry. And so my notation here for Hamiltonian vector fields is um, actually X and then the exponent is uh, the function. And here my convention is omega of um, XH is DH, but I mean, whatever, I mean. And uh, then, I mean, I'm looking at the normal autonomous Hamiltonian equation. And so in local coordinates, this is then del P of H uh, and minus the Q of H, the Hamiltonian vector field. And I mean, therefore, when we split it up in local coordinates, we get the Hamiltonian equations, the Q prime equals del P and P prime equals minus del Q. So I mean, st standard Hamiltonian, the classical Hamiltonian dynamics. And what I actually want to do, we'll have a slide later is I want to relate a nice class of these systems to integrable systems. And so, I mean, here a very special type of uh, Hamiltonian systems are systems that have a periodic flow. And uh, so technically, in, in the, I mean, these are then as one actions, Hamiltonian as one actions. And in dimension four, these things have been classified by Cachon under the additional assumption, assumption that we are effective. So in order to um, not to have to, to deal with, I mean, the double thing, I mean, double turning around. So I mean, which one could divide by them. And this is actually a very nice classification because it's really, I mean, explicit. I mean, it is done by means of a label directed graph. And we'll see on the next slide actually how this may look like. And also here, I mean, in this theorem, I already uh, denoting the Hamiltonian by L. And usually, I mean, not always, but very often in what comes later, then the Hamiltonian given by L actually induces an effective Hamiltonian as one action, so it has a periodic flow. And here, I mean, these graphs, they technically have three types of ingredients. I mean, they can have fat vertex vertices, like these here, or normal vertices or some kind of edges between uh, normal vertices. And I mean, here I have drawn a couple of very symmetric graphs, but they don't need to be symmetric. And as I said, I mean, technically, these, these um, uh, thin vertices, they come from fixed points of the action. These fat uh, vertices, they come from uh, fixed surfaces. And the edges, 
they come from, I mean, stabilizers. So, I mean, uh, components of stabilizers between the fixed points. And here, I mean, the stabilizers, or let's say the group acting there, the set model K set, one usually refers to as a set K sphere because technically, I mean, it, it really forms a sphere where the north and south will end up at the fixed points. And very often, one also puts here labels on these um, fat nodes, like um, the volume of the fixed surface or the genus, but I usually just drop it, I mean, to, to not to have too many things on, on the thing. And also, I mean, very often, in this, uh, one just plots, let's say, the Hamiltonian function in this direction. So technically, here, the um, position of these things in the horizontal direction, this gives you um, the value of the, of the momentum map. And so a priori, these are just super nice Hamiltonian systems. On the other hand, you can look at them as Hamiltonian as one actions that got nicely classified. And now I want to uh, actually um, connect it to integrable systems. And I mean, I'm talking about level integrability. I mean, today we had also more algebraic versions of integrability, but this here is really the classical one, the old one, which comes from um, the energy conservation, meaning that uh, H is constant along its solutions or other ways, uh, I mean, uh, uh, otherwise um, expressed Hamilton solutions always stay within the level set, so within the energy level. And this technical means that they always are in at least a co-dimension one subset or even lower. And in dimension two, this means we, up to parameterization, we more or less know everything about the Hamilton system once we have the level sets. And so the question is for Liebel integrability, I mean, how do we, uh, how can we, let's say, drop this dimension any further, or how can we get more information about the systems by means of, let's say, symmetries of the system? And so the idea is just then to see if you can find other Hamiltonian functions such that um, each solution stays in each other's uh, level set. And with that, then, I mean, we get the, dimension within which the solution can vary to drop down. And I mean, from uh, the arnold Liouville theorem, we know that actually we get down to half of the dimension of the manifold with independent integrals. And if you express this thing here by means of some algebraic notion or in coordinates, then we actually end up with here the usual well-known um, Poisson bracket defined by plugging in the Hamiltonian vector fields of both functions into the symplectic form. And I mean, this is just expressing here that, I mean, the variation of one function along it's the solution of another function. And so technically being integrable here means um, we are Poisson commuting. So, I mean, the Poisson bracket of the two Hamilton functions vanishes. And this, of course, you can do in dimension two n, but here specifically, since Cachon's classification was uh, done in dimension four, we are also sticking here to dimension four because, I mean, we want to relate to her classification. And um, so I also just write down here the, the definition of a completely integrable system in dimension four, although this, of course, can also be done in dimension two n. So I want to have them to one vector fields to be almost every linear independent, and they should also commute. And in particular, I mean, when L and H are more or less arbitrary, we get then an um, R2 action. And later on, we will see that this R2 action, if the L induces action as one action, gives something as one times R action. And so, I mean, you can see these things more from a geometric or dynamical point of view, like myself usually do it. Or you can also look at many things uh, from the point of view of Lie groups or group actions. And this is here one of these slightly distorted diagrams, which I would have liked to draw much nicer, but was doing it in ticks and there I'm not really an expert. So, I mean, the aim of this talk is actually the following thing. I mean, down here, we have these Hamiltonian as one spaces. So these classified Hamiltonian as one actions by Cachon. And what Cachon actually managed to do 20 years ago was under certain uh, assumptions here, namely that the genus of all symplect all fixed surfaces is zero, and that um, in each uh, level set, I have at most two non-free orbits. 
then she could actually extend this as one action to a torus action. To a torus hamilton is one times another hamilton is one action, such that the whole thing actually is an integral system. And she also noticed that if I have such a thing here and I forget one of these actions, I actually end up precisely with these type of um, Hamiltonian as one spaces. So actions where the fixed surface only can have genus zero and um, at most uh, two non-free orbits in each uh, level set. And the idea is then, well, let's put it like that. At some point, then about 10 years ago, here, um, Lai and Von Gogh managed to classify so-called semi-toric systems. I come to this definition later. So the more important thing is that they actually have an underlying S1 times R action. And so at that point, together with um, uh, two colleagues, uh, Silvia Sabatini and Daniel Seppel, we ask ourselves if the classification here actually has something to do with um, the classification here of the underlying S1 action. And we somehow manage to, to see how they relate. And then together with uh, Margaret Symington, we also started at some point then to lift the whole thing and to see if um, we actually can extend this thing in a somewhat reasonable way to integral systems, in this case, to so-called semi-toric systems. But I mean, the thing was then a little bit dragging on because each of us at some point got permanent positions, was overloaded with teaching and so on and so on and so on. So. Uh, but at some point, we actually uh, got back to it again, or more precisely meet together with uh, Joseph Palmer. And what we actually managed to do then was uh, even get rid of these um, assumptions here and to lift all spaces. And these are the so-called, what we then called hyper systems. And the name comes from the fact that um, here, this stuff is toric plus something. And this is actually then toric plus something that contains hyperbolic uh, singularities. So this gave then the name hypersemitoric systems. And um, they, are, they are not yet classified. I mean, we just defined them as the nicest and I think most accessible, easiest, reasonable class of systems to which one would like to or could lift or should lift these uh, S1 actions on four dimension manifolds. And in what now comes, I want to explain a little bit these various classes of systems that are around. And uh, let's even see. So I mean, before I start, the essential point or one of the essential uh, points are actually the singular points. And here, I just want to say that, uh, I mean, being in dimension four, we have a critical point if the rank here of this um, function consisting of L and H drops uh, lower, uh, is less than two. And I mean, there's a notion of non-degeneracy for the critical points or singular points. And here, I mean, for fixed points, you can easily write it down actually in terms of linear algebra. You can also formulate it by means of, um, of uh, Cartan, uh, sub, uh, Cartan su uh, sub algebras and these kind of things. But if you have examples, this is much easier. So this is, this is really doable and no problem. And another important thing is that the very moment you have non-degenerate critical points, you have a local normal form. And this local normal form tells you actually that um, this singularity decomposes into either hyperbolic, elliptic, focus-focus components, or actually has regular components. So this means that the very moment it's non-degenerate, you have a nice control over what's actually happening. And uh, in particular, when we have now the easiest type of integrable systems, namely toric systems, meaning that uh, both here, the L and the H induce periodic flows, mm -hmm. then let's have a look at a super easy example, let's say here on CP2 going to R2 with the standard rotations. And if you have then a look at the fibers, I mean, you see that actually the image of the momentum map here is a triangle and that here the strata of this triangle correspond actually to somehow the dimension of the fibers. So I mean, here over the vertices, you have really, I mean, elliptic fixed points, or elliptic elliptic fixed points. Over the edges, I mean, you have elliptic regular stuff. And in the middle, you have re just regular points or regular fibers. And I mean, being toric is very nice. And the really useful thing also then for the constructions we need later is 
that there is a constructive classification. So you really can build this stuff. Going from here from a toric system to its classifying object, namely the image of the momentum map is super easy. I mean, you just evaluate the thing, but going backwards is also feasible. I mean, you can do it. It's, it's, it's more or less linear algebra. It takes a while, but given whatever, you can build it. And this is quite useful. But on the other hand, I mean, toric stuff is of course a, a little bit boring because it boils down to combinatorics and it's a very, very special situation. But uh, nevertheless, I mean, as I already explained here in the, right in the beginning with the overview, Kashon already showed then how to lift these special Hamilton as one actions to toric systems. And this can be done explicitly. I mean, she, she given these things here, she constructed it, done. Okay, but of course, I mean, this, this is a really special class. And here now we, uh, the semi toric systems come in Again, we are on in dimension four. And this notion of being semi I think, has partially generalized to dimension six. And there has also been some work by Kaushon and so on on, let's say, actions uh, with um, co dimension two and so on. But here we, we stay in dimension four. A priori, we do not need to be compact. This comes later when we want to apply the things. And this definition, I think, originally actually goes back to von Gogh. But since I always refer to and use the classification, I always uh, put both people, so Pelayo and Van Gogh. And semi means that I have an integrable system such that the L is proper. Moreover, the L uses an effective Hamilton as one action. We only have for the whole system only non-degenerate singularities and nothing hyperbolic. This, this is essential here, nothing hyperbolic. And this gives us the following. I mean, on the one hand here, we get an underlying S1 times R action. And the possible singularities, they are not as restrictive as in the torque situation where we only had elliptic elliptic and elliptic regular, but they also admit focus focus. And this already gives much more um, flexibility of the systems and makes it a much larger class. But nevertheless, it's still, let's say practical in the sense of that there comes a classification or there is a classification. And here, I mean, you can see a little bit or get a feeling for these systems. So, I mean, instead of having here a proper polygon with straight edges, I mean, you have some kind of curvy whatever. And the thing is, uh, I mean, a closed polygon or a compact polygon when um, the manifold is compact and otherwise the thing is open. And here, I mean, above the, the boundary again, you have the elliptic regular single uh, stuff. About, above the vertices, you have elliptic elliptic. But here in the middle, you also may have um, some isolated um, critical values, where in the fiber, you actually have here some pinch, uh, a pinch in the torus. So, I mean, I think these, these singularities, they show us up in left shift vibration and so on. So, it's, we call it focus focus, but I think there's also a bunch of other notions around. And um, I mean, the main, or the interesting fact actually is that when you cut in here, when you cut in here downwards to, um, let's say one of these focus focus um, values, you somehow can make the whole thing um, some, something is making a noise here, I think. Hmm. Oh. You can get rid of this kind of um, curvature that is induced by these singularities and you can straighten it out and you get back something toric at the cost of some cut here and an additional vertex. So you still have a lot of, um, some, lot of uh, flavor from toric systems. But nevertheless, when you look at the classification due to Polay and Van Gogh, you see that, I mean, on the one hand, I mean, I mean you have, you have technically five invariants if you want to, unravel the whole thing a little bit versus just one invariant is a toric thing. So, I mean, you need to count the um, focus focus singularities at each focus focus singularities. I mean, you have how that thing actually expands, let's say. I mean, from the toric situation here, some kind of generalized polygon survives. So well, this kind of thing here, you should think about maybe. I mean, it also matters where actually these points here 
ends up in the polygon. It's called the height invariant. And then there's something else I don't want to talk about at the moment. This is the so-called twisting index invariant. This tells you a little bit how, how I mean, that thing here um, fits together with, with the action angle coordinates in the background once you did a cut, but okay. But nevertheless, I mean, you have a feasible classification and there has have also now been a couple of papers where these things have actually have been calculated for examples. I mean, it's not easy, but one can do it. And there are also a lot of um, nice physical examples for these systems. So, I mean, coupled spin oscillators where you have, let's say, rotation here on the sphere, rotation here on the um, plane given by one of the functions. And the other function is then just, I mean, the preserved angle here between the projected vector here and there. So this, this is, I mean, a semi-toric system or the coupled angular momenta where you just have then, I mean, the rotation on the sphere on two spheres and the preserved angle between them. This is also, I mean, a semi-toric system. And the interesting thing here is, this is what motivates the following examples. I mean, it was uh, defined here with some parameter T. And Sadovsky and Zielinski already, they somehow studied how this uh, focus focus uh, point here moves in the manifold or the velo here in, that, in the image of the momentum map when you change the T here. And uh, this actually motivated then here the following thing because in these two other examples, you only have one focus focus point. But if you actually are supposed to celebrate having focus focus points, I mean, and you want to classify something, you want to have examples with more. And so together with uh, Joseph Palmer, um, I managed to um, get a system by playing around with the um, coupled angular momenta. And then, I mean, here we had four uh, parameters, which you actually boil down and technically to two parameters. And when you then plot the image of the momentum map, which makes sense, like in, since you can do a lot with this image of the momentum map, like in toric systems, you see that I think in one of these parts here, I think here somehow, I mean, the coupled angular momenta would be hidden as moving um, parameter. And uh, here in the middle, you see how these points here move in. So, I mean, semi-toric systems, they, they are much, more interesting than the toric stuff, but feasible. And here again, I mean, with this, with a more global approach, Le Floch and Palmer uh, came from a Hirzebuch Hirt surface, but dropped this thing and also got semi toric systems as two focus focus points. And I mean, to top that off, I mean, together with one of my master students, I considered an octagon and constructed the toric system. Uh, uh, that belongs to this one here. And then we made here the focus focus points move in simultaneously. And once when, so we got asked for four focus focus points and in the middle actually they hit. So, I mean, here we have double pinch Tori and the really cool thing is you can parameterize them. I mean, this is a formula, one line and you have it. This is uh, <laughs> really nice. And you can observe all these things explicitly if you want. And so, I mean, therefore, let's maybe see where we are actually now. I mean, not just looking at the time, but also at um, the classification. So this year, as we already had, this is the toric part done by Kashon 20 years ago. This one here is now where the semi toric systems, which project down when I just forget the integral that is not um, having an S1 action. And it goes down to um, S1 actions which have also again fixed surfaces with genus zero. But what one may now have is at most, at most two non-free non-fixed orbits in each uh, um, level set of the L. And this, let's say, let's maybe see if we can go back somewhere. I mean, I mean, intuitively one can see the problem one is hitting all this here a little bit. These edges, in the graphs, they come here from the boundary somehow. And as long as you're playing with polygons, you can have two, two of these, these, these edges in a graph of a cushion of, of an S1 action. And if you have here in the middle some fixed points, you have maybe a couple of um, isolated fixed points around. But what you cannot have is this approach here, 
coming from semi-torque and torque stuff is something that actually has three edges in the middle, like we had in the very beginning in one of these graphs. This you cannot get with this approach because, as I said, edges, they somehow correspond to the boundary of a polygon. And this is still a proper a decent polygon. Here we had nice polygons, so no way to get it there. And so then, I mean, the um, IS process in here, uh, as I said in right in the beginning, this here was done, I mean, recovering the classification of Cachon was done here by, um, together with uh, Silvia Sabatini and Daniel Sepe. And here the lifting thing is ongoing uh, in addition with Margaret Symington. And uh, then let's have a look at, I mean, time is running at the hypersymmetric systems. So what we then did was, again, we are in four dimensions on a compact uh, connected symplectic manifold. We look at an completely integrable systems and we say it is hypersymmetric if, well, on the one hand, we need again an underlying S1 action because otherwise we do not relate to Cachon's S1 actions. But, and now this, this is the, um, quite big step, I would say, we admit a priori for the system, all kinds of singularities that are non-degenerate, except maybe a fi finally many um, nice degenerate gener points. And nice, we mean so-called parabolic degenerate points. And first of all, this means concerning this classification right in the beginning that we had for how, um, how singular points of integrable systems may look like, we actually get each and everything, all combinations that are possible in dimension four, except hyperbolic, hyperbolic. This we cannot get because, I mean, this just cannot exist as long as we have an underlying S1 action. But everything else may appear. So this, this is a quite large class and um, gets far, far, far away from, um, let's, uh, the restrictive semi-toric or toric stuff. And um, let's see. Here, let's maybe get a feeling for it, what's actually happening. I mean, technically, you have here around, let's say, some semi stuff. But here in the middle, somehow, you have, you glue on the whole thing some, some other system. So some kind, you have some kind of flap, let's say. And when you then just look what's, what's happening here, I mean, here you just have normal tori, let's say, as some um, fibers. Here you would have two tori, I mean, two dis uh, dis a disconnected fiber here over this, this flap here. And here along the boundary, I mean, they are glued together, let's say. And here at the boundary, I mean, the stuff degenerates. I mean, when, when you look what's, what's happening here along these fibers here on, this, on the side and there, you notice that here that thing gets some kind of um, cusp. And this here are the degenerate points. And when you have these kind of things, you cannot, you cannot avoid them. I mean, no chance. So if one wants to do the step from semi toric systems or toric systems to something else, where hyperbolic stuff may appear or needs to appear, you can't get around degenerate stuff, but you can nevertheless say, I want to have nice degenerate stuff. And here's another situation where this may show up. So, I mean, when you just, let's say, take here something and you pull it in somehow. So you get, you get something that is um, pulled over each other. So this, this is then some called a swallow tail or I think a plate sometimes. I mean, technically I hear the definition of parallelic points, but I think given the time I spare you going through it, let's just say it. I mean, it's the concerning non-degeneracy the most non-degenerate degenerate point that you can have. It comes directly after having, well, degenerate point, uh, non-degenerate points in the sense of this uh, local normal form. And with that, let's get just to, to the formal theorem. So, I mean, if we have such a uh, four-dimensional compact connected symplectic manifold, then given any kind of um, Hamiltonian that induces an effective S1 action, we can find a smooth H, so another Hamiltonian, such that here L and H together form a hypersymmetric system. And as I already said, I mean, some L force the existence of degenerate points. And um, I mean, there you can choose a little bit what kind of points you want to have. I think Daniel Sepe together with Sue Tolman are 
are um, admitting less hyperbolic but more degenerate stuff. So this, but the paper is not yet out, so I don't know details. But similarly, this can also be done. And as I already said, I mean, from our point of view, these hypersymmetric systems are the nicest and easiest class to which you can lift, let's say, S1 actions if you really want to be able to lift each and everything. And we don't have much time for the proof. Let's just say, I mean, the first part comes from already lifting to semi-toric systems. So you start with a toric system. You somehow need to create an isolated fixed point in the middle. So you need to get by um, blowing up somehow then at some point of uh, focus focus point. And here you can see what's happening to the Cachon graph. I mean, here, this is this um, the fixed surface. Here, these uh, boundaries here, they give you these edges here. And that thing here, again, gives you an isolated point. I should have said that stuff that has um, slope plus minus 1 is not um, represented as, a, as an edge. And here, I mean, you see that thing gives you here a point in the middle. So that thing here can lift the torque, because whenever you cut here uh, vertically, you only hit maximally two things. When you cut here, you hit possibly three things. So this goes to semi torque. And here now, um, when we want to get in the Cachon graph also something that has inner edges, our trick is now let's take here the focus focus point. Let's replace it locally by a flap. So I mean, that thing is actually an elliptic elliptic. And here we have degenerate stuff. And this originally was locally done by um, Dulin and Pelayo, I think in 2016 or something like that. And then we cut off here, I mean, the edge. So we blow it up here. And we get here our tiny little edge. And I mean, you need to make sure that you always have enough space, to, that you can suck enough uh, volume into these flaps if necessary. But this can be done. And with that, I mean, we now get here to the very final column. So with that, we are able to lift all Hamiltonian S1 spaces to a reasonably nice and, uh, let's say, practical class of systems. And I mean, the paper is on the archive. And uh, we are thinking a little bit about what one would need for classifications. One of my PhD students is busy with studying, let's say, fibers of these systems. But um, this is ongoing work. So there we have not yet done anything. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I think I'm more or less finished in time. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes, Anton. Um, hi, Sonia. Thanks for a nice talk. So, so how is it in all, all those uh, exotic examples? Do you also have some control of uh, what kind of other geometric structures uh, those uh, manifolds carry, like for instance, uh, what, what kind of what, what uh, structures? geometric structures are mm -hmm. some of them Keller or are there abstractions for being Keller if there is this or that type of singularity? Or I don't quite know. Or of course now we can also ask about uh, some other generalized generalized complex structure, which of course symplectic structure is a particular example. So, but do, do, do you know more about geometry of those? Uh, I mean, of those spaces. I mean, so far we haven't really started it under this point of view. I mean, I'm pretty sure that at some point, how should I put it? I mean, I'm. I mean, I mean, we we used how should I put it? Cauchons as one actions or her classification comes together with a minim minimal model approach. So she has a couple of minimal models that um, may appear with some many forces may appear and everything else comes from the blow ups. So I think your question, I mean, one would have to check what's happening if one takes her minimal models and goes through the blow ups because these things then are for us somehow the, the basic models, which we then try to modify. So if there are res restrictions, I guess they would come they may, could, would show up there because I think putting in this tiny little flap there, it doesn't change anything to what we had before. Because, I mean, this, this focus focus thing just gets locally replaced by, by this, this flap. And as far as we could see, it didn't affect anything globally, not the mon 
monodromy or these kind of things. So I, I think if at all, it's it's already um, at the lower, lower um, step, I would say. Okay, thank you. But okay, more questions? So I suppose oh. that this, the, the genus of those fixed surfaces is also part of the classification. So you have some examples for any genus or? or Oof. I mean, if I can get any genus, I mean, I mean, it depends. Uh, let's put it like that. I think the easiest would be when you look at these monster, uh, not monster classification, at the atom classifications that was done by Bosner from, and from Menko. And when you start gluing these things together, you, you get a feeling of what kind of things you can have. Okay. I mean, in our situation, when we were doing this kind of lifting, we always lifted to nice surfaces. So we usually had just some two tor toric glued to each other, or we had some curled toros or some of these things. So in our situation, nothing bad happened because we didn't force it to happen. Okay. But one of my PhD students, I mean, he put his um, time and uh, spirit into um, f uh, finding nastier examples. And as far as I know, I mean, he found uh, fibers that looked uh, as not as bad as they wanted, but I mean, as bad as he could get it with a decent um, perturbation. So um, we have a question by Alvaro. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay, so Sonia, thank you for your talk. I have two quick questions. The first one, in the octagon example, which invariants can you compute explicitly? And the second question is, when you add hyperbolic singularities to the situation, uh, what other invariants do you expect that are needed for a classification? Um, concerning the octagon, I mean, let's put it here, concerning classification altogether. I mean, the covered spin oscillator and the covered angular momentum, they are completely classified. I mean, Tyler says up to third or fourth degree. Then, I mean, the system with two focus focus points, which I showed you there, for a nice situation, we also have it, including um, the twisting index, but the paper is not yet out because I'm still uh, editing a little bit something with um, background for twisting index, but this we got. And concerning the octagon system, I mean, so far nobody has really looked into calculating all these, class uh, these invariants. On the one hand, I mean, I think because Jaume now after calculating the invariants for four systems is a little bit sick of it. <laughs> And on the <laughs> other hand, um, I do not have at the moment a PhD student who loves Mathematica, so I couldn't dump it on anybody else. So this, this is right now the state of the art with the octagon system. So there we didn't do anything apart from having, I mean, the, um, well, I mean, the number of focus focus points and how the system really looks lies nicely. I mean, you can calculate it. So, I mean, I mean, it's, it's given actually the, f the formula for, for this uh, double pinch torus is one line. I'm afraid, and people, the, I'm afraid people from the next talk are coming in, so maybe <laughs> you have a very quick question, answer. <laughs> okay, and con concerning the hyperbolic stuff, ugh, this is a good question. I mean, we are not sure, because locally, when we replaced the focus focus by this flap, it didn't change that much. So we were very confused, and we are really not sure. So okay, may maybe try to get hold of Joey. Maybe he has more ideas by now, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for all the speakers of this session. And let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and conclude uh, this and, today's And session. let's thank the organizers. I mean, I'm the last speaker. I mean, I shouldn't forget about that. <laughs> so <laughs> let's okay, thank the organizers we have, we have one more for today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.